We have uh, Marie who just uh, joined us. Marie is uh, head of the publishing uh, and open access department uh, of the Sorbonne Uni uh, University Library. And uh, she is also involved in several uh, professional organizations such as the uh, Open Archive Work Group and the Couperin Co Consortium in France, uh, promoting open access and open science in the academic field. And uh, it would be uh, with Marie to have this uh, also your feedback. Maybe we can start with, uh, with that, your feedback about uh, the two presentations and maybe some specificities of uh, French landscape for open access would be uh, important. And after, maybe we will uh, ask you uh, if you have some question. But I will be really interested in you are working in open access for several years or advocating open access. And what are for you the big change and the big evolution this last year for this uh, now open science, open access is a trendy topic and with a lot of uh, action for also public policy. That's why. What is the evolution you have seen these last years and what for you, and we have a lot of researchers, PhD students uh, here this morning. What are the take home message? Some, some little things that they have to be aware when they are trying to open their research, generally. Thank you. And I let you. Okay, so uh, first, thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion. Uh, that was really interesting, and I must say I really relate to your experiences. So uh, first, Colleen, I think we uh, share a lot of uh, topics we're dealing with uh, on a daily basis because uh, um, so I'm working at the Sorbonne University Library, uh, also with researchers, and uh, actually I can relate to everything you mentioned because these are really the topics we are involved in. Um, especially, uh, I think we should mention the importance of training because as you said, um, I think every uh, research field has uh, its own specificities and its own habits and its own uh, journals you're publishing in or not publishing in. And um, I think what's really important to us as librarians, uh, it's maybe to help you uh, decide how you can uh, how you can improve the way you publish and how you can improve um, the way you are sharing the knowledge you're producing. Um, that's why we are especially involved in training at uh, the Sorbonne University Library and also um, training for uh, PhD students. So maybe that would be uh, my main insight here. Uh, just uh, you, have to, uh, you have to train yourselves, but you also have to make this students working with you, uh, be aware of these questions as soon as they start their researchers' lives. Um, they have to know all these uh, questions uh, so, they can, uh, so they can publish wisely, so to say. <laughs> um, Brandon, about all uh, you mentioned, what I found really interesting is that we can see um, many initiatives going in this direction of um, like peer reviewing, peer commenting, and uh, um, such as PCI, for instance, or your own platforms, or um, and I think even without the existence of these platforms, this is general. Uh, direction because we can see that uh, on archive or people are already exchanging these comments. So where we can maybe work together is like implementing this. Uh, I was really interested in the small tools you showed us in the end. You know, like the add-ons you can put. Uh, I found it's really super interesting, and we have some some uh, some add-ons like this for for uh, open access. So you can uh, determine if the paper you're looking for is available somewhere on the internet and uh, not only on Sci-Hub but somewhere on the legal internet uh, open access and uh, yeah so that was really interesting to, see, to me to see that um, what I can say about uh, the specific situation here in France I think we are uh, dealing with exactly the same issues and um, I think the role of our libraries or research supports in universities is really to help researchers uh, with all these tools um, and that's what we are trying to do.
Oh, I think I said everything I need to say on my presentation. Just open. Yes, you have a question. Hi. Over here. <laughs> Uh, hi, um, so I've got a question for Colleen. Uh, great talk, and uh, it's great that institutions are starting to stop paying for subscri subscriptions to us every year. Um, but I was, having said that, I was kind of curious, when you say that no one's complaining and that they're deal with, dealing with it, how are they dealing with it? So if you can't access, the, as a scientist, the papers that you need to read, are they going on Sci-Hub, or there's got to be a way around it? No, I... Um, I know that in my own library, we have created a, a dedicated service to provide what we call post-cancellation access. Um, we are in a fortunate situation because um, back files had been purchased in many years ago, so there's some historical back file already there. But, um, and there are, I, I, maybe I can include it in the references, I can add a slide of references, but it's not just in, um, in, in, in Germany, but it's happened in Sweden as well. I, I think, I mean, also in France, there are libraries out there who've created um, pages, um, get the PDF. If you Google get the PDF, I think you, that'll pop up. It's in, in the Netherlands, they created this PDF with a list of you know 10 places you could, or 10 things you can do to try to find this article. Um, but I think your libraries are absolutely thrilled to help you find the content. That's, that's what they're there for. Um, but I, I, just one more comment about that is, you know, we think we can't live without subscriptions, but you know, you think that this journal is essential, but when you really dig down into it, that perceived demand is much greater than the actual demand. Um, you know, even we see even uh, users today go uh, try to get access to content. If they don't get it at the first shot, they just go somewhere else. You know, um, maybe that's not your personal experience, but. Um, yeah, we're paying a lot of money for subscriptions and we're not actually getting the value out of it that we think we are. Maybe I can add something for the French situation, uh, a concrete example of what you mentioned. Um, you are looking for a special paper and your institution uh, didn't get the chance or the possibility uh, to, to have the subscription to that journal. Um, if you as a researcher have uh, the habit to deposit your own publication into a green uh, open archive, for instance, um, you, uh, well, the French open archive we use uh, at Sorbonne University is Al, and um, so it's a sub, so it's um, it has to respect an embargo. If you deposit your publication, you have to wait for like uh, six months in your field uh, before uh, the paper is accessible. But there is a button, and it means that the person who wants to have access to the PDF can just contact you even before the embargo is uh, finished. So it means you also have, as a researcher, a role to play in this uh, sharing of uh, the paper you produce. And it's uh, related that when you are also a researcher, today there is a new law in France, there is a loi république numérique with a specific article. On, now you have the right to share your article after this embargo of six months in STM and 12 months in social sciences. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for the presentations. I have just one question. I would like to know what do you think is the responsibility of the researchers and with this issue for having access to publications? And by researchers, I mean like no PhD students, no postdocs, like professors who have power in a permanent position. Uh, for example, in the machine learning community, uh, Nature was planning to have a new uh, journal for machine learning and the community they just refuse it. They have the power. They say, we will not publish on this new uh, journal. We will not review these articles. We, we have our own journal, which is open access. So I, I, I have the feeling that a lot of, of course, my generation, we will take this responsibility in the future. But I think now, professors with permanent positions or rock stars in the fields, I think they have the power for publishing in open access, but of course this is my naive point of view as a PhD student. So I would like to know what do you think about this, this, this responsibility. <laughs> no, I think um, this is what it's all about. 
Patty Smith, people have the power. <laughs> the libraries need to understand the leverage power that they have, which is the, their subscription dollars, the institutions, right? The researchers need to understand the leverage power they have, and they are the ones producing the research. They're doing the editorial um, review. Uh, they have that power in their hands to change things, and so. The, the, the example I showed of the journal that you know, the editorial board that stepped down to create a new open access journal, I applaud that. That's a great thing. And now it's then up to the institutions to follow along that and take their money out of the system since you know, the publishing actually went to a different place. Um, you can be vocal with your administrators and, and have them, as I mentioned before, uh, try to um, negotiate with the publishers to change the system or yeah, open access mandates but it's everybody's job to change the system it will take all of the stakeholders working together to change the system and that is researchers administrators libraries funders all together I would say yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess I could add something to that um, I think one response one thing that researchers can do I mean the reason we're in this situation is because um, we are all um, we're all after these high impact publications, right? And I think one thing that, that we can do as researchers to kind of devalue those high impact uh, publications is to write reviews about the articles you read. And the more reviews that we have, the more people reviewing and making these reviews public, the more that body of information is going to become more important than the impact factor itself. And so these, these high impact factor journals that, um, that, we're, that we're interested in are gonna become just you know, less valuable. What's gonna become more valuable is what the community thinks of your article, no matter where it's published. So maybe that's one thing that scientists can do. Yeah, and this all uh, can be also measured uh, because I think that's important if we are talking about evaluation, we are talking about impact and so on. So people have to use other measurements so they can know like that there is an impact of what they are publishing. And that's why uh, maybe you heard about alt metrics and all these uh, other, way, uh, other ways uh, to, to calculate the impact of a publication. So I think uh, here in France, what's really important to us is what we called uh, bibliodiversity, bibliodiversity, I don't know. So the idea is really that um, we are not saying that uh, we can change everything right now. We are not saying like there is one model and uh, that this is the only model you should follow because we know <coughs> you all have like um, strong incentives to publish in such journal and not in the other journal and these kind of things. And that's really, uh, we are not telling you uh, you should publish only open access, but we are saying that there are many, many ways that you can um, like bend the curve and uh, try to um, start to take this other path. And uh, it can be like with depositing your publication in open archive, even if they are published in like big journals. It can be uh, trying to uh, share it with your peers with a preprints. It can, there are many, many ways, and so uh, that's maybe where we should start. And as you mentioned, uh, if we are enough people doing this, then we can like really start to do this uh, advocacy work so the big institution uh, start negotiating with publishers and uh, with big companies. Uh, well, I'm, 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 I think I should ask you the obvious question. So you have BioArchive now that is uh, receiving your papers for free uh, and you're making a review system. So this is an opportunity to sort of bypass the normal review process and, and just go, go all for it. Um, BioArchive is not fully funded by the Zuckerberg Foundation, as I know, I think. Um, so I'm wondering if you're working with them to integrate better, you know, like to have like multiple submission of BioArchive paper after pub be a review. I don't know, like is this something you're thinking about or? Um, yeah. Yeah, we're we're thinking a lot about that. We haven't um, we haven't made any uh, long-lasting connections. Although um, now the bioarchive, if there is a review on Puppier, the bioarchive shows that on the bioarchive. So if you write a review on Puppier on a preprint on bioarchive, they um, they bioarchive links to it back at Puppier. 
Um, you know, I think there's a lot of apprehension on both sides how this is going to evolve, so nobody's really kind of jumped into the swimming pool entirely. Um, but I think, you know, this is, everybody's getting a little bit more comfortable with this, this new kind of possibility of doing things, and that's definitely, you know, that's my dream for how, how science should progress in the future, and hopefully we should get there. Uh, here. Um, I have a question related to what Brandon presented, related to the post-review, post-publication post review. Uh, you show that when, when you have the options of review uh, as an anonymous comment, uh, you have more, more reviews, but don't you think it would increase, the, it will enrich uh, the system if it's possible at least to give the background of the person? I ask from my personal experience that every time, well, not every time, but many times I participated in journal clubs. When a journal is destroyed, it's because, for example, uh, a group published something in neurology, and for example, and they apply tools from machine learning, uh, but they are not experts on machine learning, so they, they don't validate properly the method, or also when applying some linear algebra, uh, tools, there are some mistakes, so uh, maybe if knowing that the background of the reviewer is from this tool uh, that was applied, maybe can can enrich the, the publication. Uh, yeah, so there's, I mean, there's many um, pluses and minuses of anonymous commenting, but for this specific example that you raise, um, I personally am more interested in, if, if you're a machine learning expert and you're reviewing a paper in biology, I'm more interested in what you have to say about the article, the content of your comment, than what your background is. You know, I want to know that you've made a solid argument, not that you're an expert in the field, because there are experts in the field that make, um, that make uh, unuseful comments also. So I think um, the philosophy of pub peer is that it's the content of the comments that's important, irrespective of the background of the person. Because you know there are people that are not experts that can make an excellent comment, and I don't think we should discount their comments just because they're not a, uh, you know, uh, classically trained in that field, for example. Does that answer your question? Yeah, time for two more questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I have first one comment and then uh, one question. My trivial comment, but so, sorry if it's trivial, is that I think nowadays there is absolutely no reason for not putting every paper as author version on an open archive. Really, this should never happen because it takes only a few minutes. There, we, we have the power right now to make everything we publish open access, it's legal, as you said. So I think there is really no reason to not to do that. And one question for Marie, uh, if I may. Uh, I think that HAL is great, but, and it has many great features, but it could have one more feature, uh, is to, to have a tool that would make from the author version a nice, um, set up uh, because at the end that's the only thing that is left to the publishers now is that it's just nicer so if Al could generate it for us then really there is nothing left for the publisher I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, I can just say uh, thank you for your uh, for your comments. And uh, uh, actually, if you have, well, maybe I can add something. If you have like this kind of comment about HAL, you can always like write to the people uh, who are uh, curating the HAL uh, archives in your university or institutions, because we are also in contact with the developers, and we can suggest them like to do something. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely uh, encourage. Uh, as you said, it only takes a few minutes. It has been changed in the last um, years and months, and now the version of how you can find is even easier than before. In only a few clicks, you can uh, you can have um, all the metadata and uh, and of your papers. So yeah, definitely you should all put your papers in open okay. Yeah, I, actually, it's more uh, of a comment and. Uh, an experience that I have with the open access journals for the moment. So I have two papers published in the scientific reports and one in Frontiers, and I think we can 
just skip this step of publishing with this journal. And in Frontiers, it's easy. You see the, the names of the reviewers. And my experience in the last paper that there is one reviewer that was an expert in the field, and one I don't even know who he was. So sometimes the paper, and how many papers I received to review from Frontiers, they really don't fit at all in my, in my scientific um, uh, background. And for scientific reports, I waited, I don't know how many months for some reviewers, and finally they were, I mean, they were awful reviewers. There was nothing that was scientific in these reviewers, and I waited and waited. And actually there was maybe one reviewer, and I felt bad because I sent a paper for review because I want comments, and I want inputs, and I want some advices, and it was use, useless. So all this, so I spent money to publish. <laughs> uh, you probably know it's about, Probably it was 2,000 uh, euros for each of these uh, papers. And I didn't get what I wanted. It was a clear review. So probably we should just skip this step and just go to the all archives or uh, open archives. And I agree with you. <laughs> Just to conclude, um, I, I would say, yeah, sure. The complication we, we might encounter um, when we talk about research being um, collaborative, because if you are collaborating with an author that has a completely different perspective, I mean, th then you run into difficulties. But uh, I mean, that's a percentage of the research being produced. It's a, it's a growing percentage, right? Um, where you're collaborating across borders. But just to um, just to tie, like, final statement from um, myself would be um, that. At OA 2020, our objective is not simply to keep a research in the hands of this small group of publishers. Our research, our our objective is to take money out of subscriptions and to shift that to fund open access dissemination of research, whatever that might be. I mean, I think if we can, we can shift the business model of the large publishers, it will. Um, liberate the money so that it can be articulated at the individual paper level, and things can happen then, right? Things can happen. We, we can invest our funds in other, in other tools, for example. Okay, so maybe just, uh, you mentioned pessimists, so I would say uh, power to the researchers. <laughs> yeah, and to follow up on that, I think that, you know, we are sitting back waiting for a lot of these things to happen for us. We're dependent on the funders, we're dependent on the, the, um, the journals. But you know, this response to the, to the one question I had, I think this is something that we can do. If we all just review a paper as soon as we read it, write some comment about it, that has a huge value and that's going to devalue the, um, the current publishing system and the current high impact factor journals. And it's something that we can do right now. Okay, thanks a lot for all